Hi everyone, thanks for joining me again. This is Peter, you're watching Thailand Bound. If you've stumbled across this channel by accident, I talk about all things Thailand. And once again today, being Saturday morning, I'm gonna be reading out some viewers' true stories that have been sent to me. Right, today guys, we're on a real marathon. I've got eight stories, believe it or not, this morning. And uh, the video is about the same length of time as it normally is, but I have a lot of shorter stories sent in to me. And I thought I'd clear them out this week. There's one or two uh, stories that aren't short. And one of the stories is really heart wrenching when I read it it almost really guys it almost brought a tear to my eye I'll tell you which one at the end see if you can guess which one it is but we've got eight stories so I'm not going to waste any time and I'm going to get straight into the first one hi Peter having enjoyed your channel many times I just felt compelled to submit my meager contribution my first trip to Thailand occurred in 1987 I was, I was on my way to Malaysia to meet a lady I eventually married, whom I had met via a dating club. I was working for a major international airline and had the free flight benefits that come with that, but never ventured outside of the USA. A cabin attendant friend upon hearing this told me, the world is a big, beautiful place. You should get out there. You have the rare opportunity to see any of it, and you should think about doing so. About the same time, I had begun my correspondence with a Malaysian Chinese woman. I already mentioned, our meeting went well and I suggested we apply for a six months fiance visa in order for her to see the USA and to determine if we had any future together, to which she agreed. It was then 1988 and I am bypassing a number of experiences I had in Thailand, including making every rookie mistake imaginable, but are having no regrets in light of the lasting memories. My airline did not serve Malaysia, so it was necessary to fly in and out of Bangkok and then take the Bangkok to Singapore train to Malaysia. On our way back to Don Wong Airport, we booked a first class cabin on the train and settled back to enjoy the experience, which was excellent until about 2 a.m. Suddenly it seemed as if the world was coming to an end and we were thrown out of our bed in the midst of a terrible derailment. There was a single fatality and many injuries, injuries but fortunately we were spared. We ended up spending the night in a jungle outside the Chompom close to the Burmese border. Sabotage was suspected as there was a separatist movement causing much trouble in southern Thailand at that time. It was an uneasy experience to say the very least. Finally, about mid-morning, a train came down from the north to retrieve the stranded passengers, but not before a train steward found us in the jungle to collect for the previous night's meal. It did not end there, however, as in Chompom, I was told I need to pay for a passage through to Bangkok. I protested, showing the agent my first class ticket to Bangkok. He responded, Oh no, sir, this is for the train that is laying on its side in the jungle. If you want to take this train to Bangkok, you must pay a separate fare. We are not in Kansas now anymore, Toto, indeed. You couldn't make it up, could you guys? The guy's been in a major train uh, collision or a derailment and somebody's been killed, a lot of um, injuries and they're, they're, they're you know, still asking for money. Okay, straight into story two, another short one. It's been probably almost a year since I first discovered your channel and still tune into your story segment every week, which I find to be a real treat. There was a bunch of guys from Germany who I started hanging out with during my two week stay in the city. I'd met them at a bar, great set of people. One of them, let's call him Phil, was the life of the party everywhere. He is a mid thirties guy that loves life, loves Thailand and the girls there. According to him, he had converted to parts of Buddhism and conducted himself with other people there in a way that brought good karma. He worked in Switzerland and came to Thailand on a regular basis, living in a happy go lucky lifestyle and seemed quite popular with the girls. After a number of nights as a group, on my last week, he picked up a girl that he seemed to know well and brought her along with us for drinks back at his place in the early hours of the morning. We all had fun chatting and drinking together in one of those high rise apartments you see in Pattaya. Around what must have been 4am with half of the guys asleep and everyone else still awake but sort of drunk, I got talking to the girl and she asked how did I like Thailand and why I didn't have a girlfriend given there are so many, girlfriend, uh, so many girls here in Pattaya. I replied that I wouldn't look for a girl in Pattaya. She asked why. 
I replied that given that a lot of them are scammers, I couldn't trust them and that the, gir and that the girls in Patia are very different from normal Thai girls who I might consider dating, but not those here. All hell broke loose after I said this. I assumed she felt personally insulted by what I had said, even though I didn't mean to offend her personally. She started screaming at me and I think she may have even thrown something at me until Phil came into the room and restrained her. She said something about me insulting her. I of course denied it. Either way, given the atmosphere, it was time for me to leave. Unfortunately, the girl won him over with her side of the story and Phil refused to talk to me for insulting his girlfriend. That's how it goes with some of these guys in Patty who, who are completely delusional when it comes to girlfriends. A few years later, when I returned to Patia doing my usual thing, I ended up sitting with a girl in a go-go bar who, upon seeing my line profile photo, recognised Phil and told me she had been his girlfriend a, four, a few years ago with photos to prove it. Apparently, according to her, he had recently lost his mother while they were together. Maybe his time in Patia and with some of these girls helped him give him comfort Patty is a, a strange place sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say on that one, I, I, I don't think if I'd been in his position, I, I would have said that to the girl because definitely she would have been offended and uh, I'm not surprised all hell broke loose. Okay, so let's move on to story number three. Hi, Peter. This is a short but recent story. I have been chatting with a 33-year-old girl from Udong. I live in Chiang Mai. She seemed very decent and we shared many stories. She never asked for anything. After about one month, I told her I would visit her in Udon. But alas, there were no flights. She said she can come to see me on the bus. Next, she asked me if I had dinner. I said yes. She said she had not eaten for three days because she lost her job due to the pandemic. I felt bad for her, so I sent her 2,000 baht. She was very appreciative. A few day days later, she said she needed bus fare as she had no money. 999 baht for the VIP bus. I sent her another 2,000 baht. I started cleaning my room, even in buying new bedding. All was set for her to arrive. The day before she was due to arrive, she asked if I could send her 260 baht for the taxi fare to the bus station as she lived far away from the bus station. I sent her 700 baht. She was due to arrive here at 10 in the morning, several hours past, and I was worried as she was not yet here. I could not con contact her on her phone. She mentioned that she, was having a fo that she was having phone issues when we last spoke. I finally took a taxi to the bus station thinking she might be there waiting for me with no way to contact me. The information booth told me that there were no buses coming from Udong as it was closed due to lockdown. Then I thought I had been scammed. I never heard from her again, even after seven years living here in Thailand. One can still be fooled if you let your guard down. At least I have a clean room and lesson learned. Yeah, that's uh, something that seems to be getting more and more familiar where guys are... I don't know why he this particular guy sent her so many. She asked for a couple of hundred baht and he sent her 700. Um, I suppose he's just feeling generous and quite kind-hearted. But it, it seems to be happening quite a bit now that this pandemic has been going on that girls are saying, I'll come and see you, and guys are sending them the money, and it's just a total scam. So hopefully that's a, a little bit of a warning for, for some of you out there. Okay, let's, um, we're nearly halfway through that. Now, this is our fourth story. It never ceases to amaze me how many of your viewers' stories relate to my experiences in Patia. I arrived in 2013. I had saved money and was able to retire when I was 50. Here is my story. I met Nin at a go-go bar shortly after arriving in Patia. She told me that she just started working there a couple of days before and that she never went out with any customers but only allowed them to buy her drinks. I bought her to my condo and before I knew it, we were a couple. Nin was 28 when I met her and I was 50 but the age difference did not seem to matter. We got along great and soon we were married. She wanted her own business so I bought her a small Thai style restaurant. She kept busy at work and seemed happy. She had a mother and a daughter who lived near, in a village near Konken in Isan. I began send, sending her mother money shortly after we were married, 30,000 baht per month. We also bought her mum a small house and expensive furniture. We also bought a house for ourselves and everything seemed to be going great. 
In 2019, we left Thailand for a visit to my home state of Florida in the USA. Shortly after arriving is when the troubles started. She began complaining about being bored. The longer we stayed in America, the more her complaining increased. I told her to go to Thailand and visit her mother and daughter and return after a month or two. The pandemic hit shortly after Nin left. I tried to get her to return to the USA, but she always had an excuse for not coming back. I was sending her money each month, 40,000 baht for her expenses. Soon, two years had passed and nothing had changed. Nin told me that due to the pandemic, she had lost her little restaurant. She also sold her house without even consulting me. In short, she sold everything I had bought for her. She began to complain about not sleeping well. Often, I would try to call her, but she would not answer her phone. Her excuse was that her phone battery was low or her internet was not working. One day, she called me crying hysterically. I asked her to explain what was happening and that she could tell me anything because I still trusted her. Her response was that I should not trust her. She confessed that she had sold the car and motorcycle that I had bought for her. She explained that she had a Thai boyfriend that she met shortly after returning to Thailand. I found out that she had a very low, uh, he had a very low paying job and that the money I sent was spent on him and his family. He also apparently pressured her to leave me. This was the reason for her confession. She begged me to forgive her and hope we could somehow work things out. Of course, that is out of the question. I am planning on returning to Thailand after everything opens up and retire there. Nin sends me messages and emails daily asking for me to come, to come back to her. I need to contact a lawyer in Pattaya and see what are my options. I have been contacted by friends in Thailand about what I should do. Some say do not do anything, just forget her uh, and walk away. And others say I should go through the legal system and get a divorce. Well, I mean, the only thing is if he married her in Thailand and he's not planning to marry another Thai girl in Thailand, then obviously he can just walk away, can't he? Uh, whether she can lay any kind of claim against him being the husband is another story. Um, but another brutal one there. Okay, let's go straight into story number five. I enjoy your YouTube channel and decided that it's time for me to send in my most notable story from Thailand. Hopefully you and your viewers can have a good laugh at my expense as I've, I've had some good laughs at the cost of many of your other viewers stories. I work in many places around the world. Back in January of 2014 I had a month off work and decided to spend that time in Chiang Mai. This would be my first trip to Thailand. At that time, I was 32 years old with a very minimal amount of research prior to arriving. I had only watched a handful of videos on YouTube. I found myself leaving Chiang Mai Airport and started my month-long adventure in an unfamiliar land. I was greeted outside of the airport by a host of taxis that were eager to get me to my destination, although I had no idea where I'd be staying since I had not booked anything prior to arrival. The friendly taxi driver told me that he would drop me off in front of some guest houses in the old city and away we went after negotiating a fair price. I was overwhelmed with excitement as we went through the busy streets of Chiang Mai and down through the small streets in the old city. Once we reached the area where all the backpackers stayed, the taxi driver let me out and bid me farewell. After a few attempts I found a decent guest house that had a couple of rooms with shower rooms and toilets. Most others in the area only offered hostel-style accommodation with dorms. I agreed on the price for a month, which equaled about 180 US dollars, and the Thai woman showed me to my room. It was a terrible room, but I was young and I didn't care. The location was ideal it was, as it was only a few blocks away from most of the action. The first few days and nights I spent my time checking out the area and eating my fill of all the delicious Thai food. I also enjoyed the girly bars. After about a week or so, when I was beginning to get comfortable and into a routine, I found myself in a nice little bar on that wasn't, it wasn't ridiculously loud or overcrowded. There were probably eight to 10 girls working there and one lady boy. The lady boy was a big hit in that bar with the older customers, which left me, to pick, which left me the pick of all the girls. I narrowed down which one I wanted to leave with and paid her bar fine after letting her know that I wasn't in any hurry to leave the bar anytime soon. She had no quarrels with staying at the bar until it closed. 
We had a fun evening playing the usual games Paul Connect for and Jenga with all of the girls and of course I was buying drinks for all of them. When the bar shut down at midnight, the girl of my choice and her friend wanted to go to an after hours club and I was more than happy to keep on partying. After the club closed at 2am, we had a bite to eat at one of the street stalls and the girl I had a bar, I had bar find told me that her and her friend were going home. Confused, I asked why she was going home since I had bar find her. She said she changed her mind and that she wanted to go home. I didn't argue with her and the two of them went on their way. It was a fun night regardless up to that point and I still wanted to party. A tuk-tuk driver asked me if I needed a ride. I told him I wanted to keep partying but everything had already closed. He told me to get in and he would take me to a place that was still open. The next day I would kick myself for not doing more research on Thailand's nightlife, Chiang Mai nightlife in particular. We took a short drive down to a place not far from the moat that had four lovely girls standing outside and had loud music inside. With excitement I paid the driver and away he went leaving me looking at the four beautiful women standing on the pavement. A big, a big woman came out of the establishment and met me on the sidewalk to explain how things worked at this bar. I was to t pick one or as many of the four women as I wanted to share a karaoke room with which offered a full menu of drinks, food and a karaoke machine. They would charge by the hour for the room and I would pay extra for anything off the menu. I chose the beauty of my liking and away we went into the small room with a flat screen karaoke machine, couch and table. The drinks began to flow and after a couple of hours I had all four of the women plus the bigger girl all partying in my small karaoke room. The alcohol definitely hindered my thoughts but luckily I had one moment of clarity and decided to ask how much my bill was up to now. The big girl scurried off and after a few minutes brought me back a bill that totaled 40,000 baht. 40,000 baht in today's money at today's exchange guys is about a thousand pounds probably about 1200 US dollars. At this point, I went from the drunkest guy in Chiang Mai to the soberest. My blood was boiling. They had charged me for being there for eight hours and an absurd amount of drinks. Being drunk, I can't account for how much alcohol I had bought, but I knew full well that I hadn't ordered the amount that I was being charged for. A long argument ensured, which didn't get me anywhere. They had called the police and I was escorted down to the street by the Thai police to the nearest ATM to withdraw the funds to cover the bill. I figured paying this bill was going to be cheaper than dealing with the Thai legal system. This was a hard lesson learned had I done better research. I would have known to avoid the karaoke bars in Chiang Mai. Hopefully my story can help others that may find themselves in a similar situation. Do not enter the karaoke bars in Chiang Mai. Yeah, I mean, this seems to be a, a familiar pattern, doesn't it? The two places where the bill gets padded out, you seem to be having a great time and you get a massive, massive bill. One of them is the upper level bars that do the tacky shows along Pak Pong, you know, the, the market, Pak Pong one. You've got the market and they have doorways that lead upstairs and they have shows um, that aren't that great, actually. But, you know, normally tourists like to go and see them at least once just to check them out. They seem to be rip-offs. And we had a story a few weeks ago, didn't we, with a similar situation, and it was in Chiang Mai, where a guy went into a karaoke bar. He was having a good time and he, he wasn't checking all his bills and uh, the same thing happened to him. But that guy... Uh, three bouncers came in and basically locked him in the room and tipped his pockets out and uh, you know they, they got his card and somehow w were able to make a transaction on the ATM machine downstairs. So a good warning there you know stay away from them bars above Pat Pong one and uh, be very very careful when you go to karaoke bars. It's not too bad I've been into karaoke bars with um, Thai people so it's not too bad then but if you go in especially alone and you don't know the scene, you're likely to be ripped off. So uh, take heed there, guys. Okay, um, let's go into story number six. And um, I, I haven't got a lot to say about this at the moment. I'll just read it. So uh, it goes, This is an extremely sad story about a man I met when I first started visiting Thailand and his tale of woe. It was 2007 and I came to Thailand with a group of fellow Aussies to watch the Asian Cup of football. I met a young lady who later became my ex-girlfriend. That's a story for another time. One day, me and my girlfriend had a coffee at a nice coffee shop in our local mall, mall and it was here I met Professor John. John was an English professor at a major Thai university. 
John had lived in Thailand for many years and warned me many times to be weary, wary of the bar girls. Little did I know that a normal Thai lady was to be his downfall. One day I called John to meet for a coffee and this stunning girl turned up at the coffee shop looking for him. He introduced me to her. This is Lek and he told me that she was one of his star students. She had come along to practice her English conversation. About a year later, John had asked me if I remember his student Lek. I said, how could I forget? She was stunning. John told me he was going away to Hong Kong with her. I told him that I didn't even know that they were an item and he said that they weren't. However, Lek needed to go to Hong Kong and needed him to go with her. Later on, John told me that they were to pretend that they were married and for his trouble, she would pay for his flight and accommodation. All he needed was to bring his own spending money. I told him that this sounded a bit weird. He said that he had an idea why she wanted to go to Hong Kong and why they were to pretend that they were married. I told him I hoped he knew what he was doing, but there is no such thing as a free holiday. For the next four weeks, they rehearsed all private information that only their partner would know, such as birth dates, likes, dislikes, where they met and so on. When they got married, etc. So the big day arrived, they were leaving at 6 p.m. John and I met for a coffee as we had done every Friday for the three years previously that I knew him. I asked him one last time if he knew what he was doing and was he sure that he was 100% sure that all would be okay. He was only going away for three days so I said that I'll see him next week for coffee. When he returned I asked John how it all went. He said that they got questioned at both Bangkok and Hong Kong airports but just the usual stuff where they married, how long, why they were in Hong Kong, etc. I then again questioned John and he came clean. He told me that Lek had told him that her fam family had a huge debt because her brother had had an accident. He was drunk and had killed someone with his car in their hometown and that they needed the money. One of Lek's friends told her that she could earn big money if she went to Hong Kong selling her wares. I asked John, I didn't know she was that type of girl. He responded she wasn't and that this was the first time she had done this and that her family really needed the money. I guess you do what you got to do. For the next three months, John and I met every Friday for coffee as we had done for years. I arrived one Friday but John failed to appear. I just thought that he'd got caught up or he was busy and forgot to call or message me that he was a no-show. I tried calling him but this his phone was switched off. Strange as John was a very punctual and would always let me know even if he if he was a minute late. On the following Tuesday, I received a strange call from the Australian Embassy asking me to go there to meet up with an Australian Embassy official. My first thoughts were that John had been in an accident or was in hospital, even possibly dead. When I got to the embassy, the official had told me that John had been arrested by Thai police under instructions issued, issued by Interpol. I was shocked. What had he been charged with? You could imagine my face when the response was human trafficking. My jaw had hit the ground. Human trafficking? When? Who? I was confused. Anyway, John had given me as a contact and the embassy official asked me many questions about John. It then dawned on me that even though we had coffee every Friday for years, I really didn't know much about him. I didn't know any contacts for him in Australia, brother, sister, parents, and I didn't even know his actual address in Thailand. The embassy official asked me if I would like to attend Klong Prem Prison with her and see him. I vowed when I, I, vowed when I moved to Thailand to never end up in a Thai prison, but I decided to go as John needed me. Klong Prem is not a very nice, rather eerie, and there was a musty odour about the place. And to say that I was scared and nervous was an understatement. Anyway, we were ushered into a room and then after 15 minutes, John came in. He appeared scared and confused and had shackles around his ankle. What happened, I asked, and he said that according to Interpol, Lek had been arrested working in a, an illegal brothel and when questioned, she had told the Hong Kong police that John told her that they were going on holiday to Hong Kong and once there, sold her to the triads. John then told us that once they got through Hong Kong customs, there was a Chinese man waiting for Lek and that was the last that he had ever seen or heard from her. 
Over the next 18 months, John had numerous court dates and in Thai, and both of us never knew what the heck was going on. John's lawyer stated that if we had money in the millions of baht, that John could get a lesser sentence or even have the case drop, but John said that both his parents were dead and that his sister in Sydney, Sydney didn't have that kind of money. In the meantime, John had asked me to try and find Lex, saying that this is a misunderstanding and that she would clear it all up. I did go to the university to look for her, but had been told that she dropped out and none of her friends had seen her after that. Australia, after that Australian man had trafficked her to the triads. What were they on about? How did they know this? I was to later discover that Lex's younger sister attended the same university and had told everyone this story. Finally, the date of the sentencing had arrived for John. Life in jail was a verdict. John's lawyer blamed me and John for this sentencing, saying that if we had paid the money as requested, the three judges uh, would have given John only eight to ten years, and with royal pardons, he would have been out in probably five years. John and I were in shock. Life in jail, so much for a free holiday. Things took a twist later that day when a young girl in the courtroom came up to me asking if I was John's friend. I said yes, and she introduced herself as Lex's younger sister. In her broken English, she asked me to pass on Lex's apologies to John, but the triads had warned Lex that if she gave them up, they would knock her and her parents off and Lex's two younger sisters. Basically, John had been set up from the start. I had debated whether I should tell him, but I thought he needed to know, as I, every time I visit him, he would ask me if I had found Lex. When I told him I could see the I, I, when I told him this I, t I could see the life literally uh, drain from his body. I visited him, him monthly for the next nine months and he was looking worse and worse each time. I could see that he was taking drugs and when I asked him he finally confessed. He told me it took away the boredom and that he had given up on leaving the jail alive. I told him to start taking English classes, but he said that he now hated the ties and that he didn't want to help or teach them anything. This was so unlike John, who for years professed he loved his love of the Thai people and their culture. He started to turn away visitors. I would put 3,000 baht in his prison account each month so he could buy some of his daily needs to try and make his, his life more comfortable. Three years after his sentence, I received a call from the embassy saying that John had died of an overdose. The official had told me that John was also HIV positive and had contracted hepatitis and diabetes. Sorry that this was a long and sad story. However, there is a very important lesson to be learned here. If something is too good to be true, then it usually is. Maybe John thought that Lek actually liked him or the thought of a free holiday inspired him, but that a moment of madness ended up costing him his, his life. So I guess, I guess by now, guys, you can guess this is a story that when I, I've read it a few times now because I have to rehearse the stories a little bit and clean them up when they get sent in. But when I first read it, I mean, I was almost welling up at the end of it. Such a sad story. I mean, this, here's a guy, a uh, university lecturer, but you know, I mean, he didn't have to take her to Hong Kong, did he? I know that's a uh, a harsh way of looking at it and I do have sympathy and it's a terrible story but it's a, le a lesson learned you know when you're in a foreign country you just don't do these kind of things okay let's move on now because that was a very heavy deep story this is story number seven this is not much of a story and more just a few simple thoughts on having a reasonable successful relationship with a Thai wife about 18 years ago, after a, a divorce from my Danish wife, I went traveling, hiking in the Himalayas, sailing in Malaysia and Florida, cycling through parts of Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand, and then scuba diving in Pattaya, Thailand. Obviously, there were other things I did in Pattaya, and eventually I did marry a bar girl and bring her back to England. We've now been married for over 15 years and go skiing every winter, play tennis in the summer, and travel quite a lot. A few things I learned along the way are 1. Take your time and date a lot of girls before selecting on one. Don't rush in, there's no hurry and there are a lot of girls to choose from in Thailand. 2. Her family will always be priority and not you. Looking after them will be her main concern and you have to accept that. Moreover, you have to remember that she came from poverty and her family still live in poverty so she will have 
constantly be concerned about her financial future, especially what will happen to her after you die. Three, it is unlikely she will be in love with you, so don't start fooling yourself that you are in a passionate, loving romance. You are not. But if you get on well together, you can still have a mutually satisfying relationship which is beneficial to both of you. 4. Be sensible about the age difference. If you are 70 and she is 20, it's hardly likely you are her idea of a romantic hero, even though she may constantly tell you that you're a handsome man and you are a big lover. Remember the old formula, divide your age by two and then add about 10 years and that's a rough guide to a reasonable age difference that can work. That does remind me of an old joke. A 70 year old Western guy went on holiday to Pattaya, Thailand and married a stunning 20 year old bar girl. When he got home his fa with his fabulous new bride, his friends asked him how on earth a wrinkly old man like him managed to get such a beautiful young girl. I lied about my age, he explained. I told her I was 90. Five, if you go and live back in your own country, let her work and have her own life if she wants it. I give my wife a generous allowance to look after her family and to buy her clothes and stuff. This allowed her to pay for her younger brother to go to university and then get a good job with the Thai government so now he can also contribute towards her family. However, if my wife wants to buy land or build a house, she must work for that money. There is a huge shortage of care workers to look after the elderly in most Western countries. And with their respect for older people, Thais are often very caring when dealing with the elderly. This only pays a minimum wage of about nine pounds an hour or 10 US dollars or 10 euro. But this can easily give a monthly salary equivalent to over 50,000 baht a month. Given that you'll be paying for your wife's living expenses, she can quickly save up enough to buy land, build a house in her village and even get a car for her family. Also, working allows her to build up her own network of friends so she won't get bored sitting at home waiting for you to return from work or having to spend 24 hours a day together. Six, and finally, if you don't trust her to be faithful, either you should never have married her or else your own character may be the problem. Maybe these few brief thoughts will be helpful to some of your viewers. All the best, Mike. So that, that's quite an interesting story, isn't it? Because often on this channel, I'll say to guys, these guys who hook up with bar girls, it's very rare you'll hear a success story, but this guy's gone into it with the right attitude and he basically knows what's what. And the tips, I'll, I'll back him up on these tips. What he's said in this video, I'll say 100% that that is a right way to think of it. Uh, and obviously he's managed to make it work. It's not always going to make it work because you might, um, you know, he's, he's actually got a girl that's willing to have this relationship. But a lot of these girls will kind of play you off with other guys and they just try to get as much as they can. But well done to him for that one. And into our final story today, as I said, it's a marathon, guys. This is number eight. It's a short story, nothing too dramatic dramatic in this one. This is just a, a small compilation of things that happened to a guy while he was in Patong in Phuket. Okay, so this is story number eight. Following on from volume 108, second story, some more adventures from my visits to Patong in Phuket. My wife and I go to visit family in Thailand every year, and during these times, I go down to Phuket for a few nights to catch up with some long-time friends. Sometimes she comes as well, sometimes she just wants time apart and so do I. In 2014, I did a Harley tour with my friends from the motorcycle theme bar and restaurant hotel. We rode a total riding distance for the day of around 300 kilometers. Along the way, we were riding past a police station and a policeman came out and pulled us over. I said to the ride leader, what's going on? He replied, the policeman just wants photo, photos of him on the Harley, so we kindly obliged. Uh, when He actually sent me a photograph of the policeman on the Harley, but I didn't ask him if I got permission to show it, so uh, unfortunately I can't, but um, quite a cool picture. Um, when riding into Patong down the infamous Patong Hill, the traffic was back up the hill, so we rolled down the emergency lane. I knew how to get back to Nikki's, but there was a Swedish couple on the tour behind me, so I was not I was watching out for them as well as dodging broken bricks on the side of the road. Scary stuff. In 2016, an expat Aussie friend of mine was managing a bar in Bangla Road. I was there one night and this freelancer started chatting me up. My friend came up to her and said to her, he's married and she's Thai. She replied in a sweet voice, bye bye. 
In 2018, I was drinking in one of my local watering holes. I had this freelancer eye me up while she was with a Farang. He noticed this and said to me, I only just met her. I said to him, I'm married to a Thai lady. She's up in Bangkok with family and I go back in a couple of days. We then got talking. He was from Queensland. It was his first time to Thailand. A couple of days later, I was talking to him again. He told me he was going to bring her on holiday to Australia later that year. I pulled him aside and gave him a lecture about bar girls and freelancers and told him to leave his emotions at home, otherwise he's going to get burnt. I've seen it too often and read about it a lot. He said, thanks for the advice. Around the same time in 2018, I was in Patong. I was walking past a store. There was a young European girl being hassled by a stall holder and was quite upset. I asked her what she, if she was all right. She replied, he is trying to get me to buy something he, that I don't want and he's really hassling me. I said to him in Thai, hello, how are you? Are you good? He replied, I do not understand. I think he was from Cambodia or Vietnam. Anyway, I replied, if you can't speak Thai, don't run a business in Thailand. Last time I was in Patong, 2019, I was in one of my Thai friends' bars and got talking to this drunk 60-year-old Aussie woman. She said to me, I want, to take, I want you to take me back to your room, if you know what I mean. I said, no way, I'm married. The woman had actually just turned 60. The next day, I was riding a scooter down Ratuthit Road where it intersects with Soy Bangla. The police do checks for licenses, helmet wearing, and now they do IDP checks, international driving permits. I was pulled over for a license check. Funny enough, the year before 2018, I was talking to the same policeman and a Farang got pulled over by one of his fellow policemen. I heard this guy say he was from Melbourne. He wasn't wearing a helmet and I said to the policeman I was talking to, I am from Melbourne. He replied, what's the fine in Melbourne? I, I said he would have to go to court, probably lose his license for a month and get fined 400 Australian dollars. He replied, oh, very tough in Melbourne. So as soon as this other police seen my face, he said to me, I know you, you're from Melbourne. Talk about the ties having memories like elephants. Later that day, I was riding, uh, I was riding back to Patong. I had just been pulled over at a checkpoint. The usual license and IDP check. I continued riding when a Farang on a scooter in front of me, no helmet, heading straight towards the checkpoint. I had to laugh. You're you're gone mate in closing i hope your viewers enjoy hearing about my little adventures in patong uh, and that's about it for that story guys but that is a uh, a familiar theme isn't it when you're uh, out and about in thailand it's all about the money and uh, remember guys uh, times have moved on now so if you rent any kind of scooter motorcycle or anything like that you've got to have a, a license and you definitely got to have a helmet or you're going to get pulled over and it's all about money i know a guy uh, the last time i was in hua hin uh, I know where the police checks are in Hua Hin and where they don't go, but this guy got pulled over, no helmet, and they just happened to smell alcohol on him, breathalyzed him, he was over limit, they wanted 20,000 baht, he managed to negotiate it down to about seven, but it's just not a good a good thing to do. Taxis are so cheap in Thailand, uh, you know, jump in, a, jump in a taxi, you'll always, you, you won't have a problem getting a taxi, it's not worth the risk being uh, drinking and driving, you, you could hurt somebody, you you could have an accident. I'm not here to lecture you, but I'm just saying, you know, stay safe and do it the sensible way. All right, guys, that's it for this, uh, this lot of stories this Saturday. I hope you enjoyed them. As always, if you've got a story, um, getting a little bit low now, I've got a few in the bin, which I will be reading out. If you've got a story, send it in. I'll change names, places, dates, uh, the normal sort of stuff, so nobody will identify you. And I'm still hoping that uh, a Western woman who's been married to a, a Western guy who's lived in Thailand and has seen the other side of things, like the lady who wrote to me and said that her friends were extremely jealous of Thai women. They felt let down, deflated, and a lot of them got divorced from their husbands. If there is any Western women out there who've got experiences of this, please write to me or get in touch. That would make a fantastic video. Uh, I'd love to tell that story. But until then, guys, until next Saturday, um, I hope you enjoy these, uh, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Okay.